Hey, good evening, everyone. If we could, before we get started, have everyone move down just a little bit closer. Yeah, we try to you know create a very intimate atmosphere where we can share and be comfortable with each other's opinions and feelings and all those things. And we've got a lot of disbursement within the room. So if you are comfortable enough, please, I will ask you to move up just a little bit closer to the front. Thank you. You ready? Um, now, we are about to get started this evening. I want to thank you guys uh, on behalf, first, of the mayor's office, uh, the office of Mayor Megan Berry. I want to thank uh, Metro BAO, uh, of course, our firm, Griffin and Strong PC, and my CEO, Rodney K. Strong, which some of you all may, may have passed him out in, in the front. Uh, Michelle Lane, as well. We want to thank you guys for being here this evening. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, to start off, I want to introduce, and we'll have remarks from a few speakers, I want to introduce President Klein from Watkins College to come give some brief remarks on behalf of the university. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, please, no, no. Um, my, my remarks will indeed be brief. It may not feel that way at times, but I, I have to laugh because, uh, you know, I'm a professional teacher and I work with professional teachers. And when we have faculty meetings in this room, they all sit in the back, which is what they complain their students do all the time. So I'm aware of the irony. Um, welcome. Welcome to Watkins. Um, if you don't know, and I've been hearing too many times, this is my first time here. So I'm going to tell you a way we can change that when I'm through. If you don't know, Watkins College is 133 years old. What? We started as the Watkins Institute. We are, were given a gift of land and the astonishing sum of $100,000 in 1885. And 133 years, we are still here serving the Nashville community. Over that time, we have served, because that's what we do, 350,000 citizens of Nashville. Everyone's grandma learned to sew curtains at Watkins Institute. And people got GEDs and learned English as a second language and took typing and did amazing and wonderful things. Now, most of our community education has moved over to the uh, crafts and fine arts. And so please check out our website, which is terrific and only a couple months old. And you can see what we offer in community education because we're going to we keep that going. Um, but now we're mostly an institute of the fine arts. We are a member of ACAD, which is the uh, consortium of the top art schools in America. Did you know that? We are in the Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design. Uh, the Rhode Island School of Design, Ringling, Art, uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Watkins, some lesser luminaries. Yes. Um, just in the past few years, we've added new programming, including two graduate programs, an MFA, Master of Fine Arts in Film Production, which is very good and very smart for Nashville. And this summer, we begin a low residency program, a Master of Fine Arts in Visual Arts. So if you are a studio artist and you want to take most of your coursework in the summer, talk to me. Come here. All right, just a few more things. Uh, as I said, we're a good community partner. And right up there behind me, you see uh, about the 50 partnerships we have uh, partnered with just this year. Um, we are a 501c3 organization. We get very little funding. We just do this because we're supposed to do this. And along those lines, we just literally just started the Watkins Design Company. And that is a, a design firm in this building staffed by students with a professional creative director who will take on projects looking mostly toward uh, organizations and institutions that are either not-for-profit or do not have the funds to pay $11 billion for a new logo. So the best contact for that until we will set up separate links, but if you want to get in the game right away, you can access that through community education. Um, and you'll see uh, a, li a link for, is your link there? Maggie Fancher. 
Maggie is sitting here watching her workload grow by the second. But Maggie is uh, the director of community education. That's in her umbrella. And she's the woman who's making that all happen. OK, and so finally, finally, if you haven't been here before since we've been in a movie theater, we're very glad to have you. What you should do, this is a really good idea, what you should do is come to our fundraiser on April 28th, OK? This is not white tie and tails, sit there with strangers, hoping that maybe you can die and get out of here. This is fun. This is 150 bucks. Don't get me wrong. 150 bucks, 150 bucks. But that's about the most affordable fundraiser you'll go to. And it's at an art school. This year's theme is the five senses. Can you imagine what this is going to be like? This is going to be really fun. So it's uh, April 28th, the last Saturday uh, in April. It's always the day of the marathon. So if you compete in the marathon, we will take $4 off your ticket price. Four. Guaranteed. Work with me, people. Ashford's in for a rough night if it's going to be like this. And that being said, I would like to introduce Ashford Hughes, Senior Advisor for Workforce Diversity and Inclusion. Welcome to Watkins. Thank you very much. Ashford. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we again want to thank uh, President Klein, Watkins College, for allowing us to be here. We want to thank our partners in this work, uh, Michelle Lane with the Office of Procurement, uh, Javal Watson, Brian Gleason uh, with the Business Assistance Office uh, for also being here. Um, we just want to thank you again for coming out tonight, working with us on an issue that's been very, very important uh, to the mayor's office. Over the last two years, and really, uh, honed in over the last year and a half. We have been aggressively looking at ways that we can make certain that uh, we find equity in contracting in our city and looking for ways that we can make certain that uh, all the prosperity that's happening reaches various communities uh, around the city as well. Uh, that's why we're glad again to be working with Griffin and Strong who does this type of work across the country and is a proven uh, entity that gets outcomes that uh, turn into equity for communities that they work to come in to help. So I now want to introduce uh, Sterling Johnson, who is with Griffin and Strong, who will give us the uh, background for today, and then we'll get this started. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started with the public hearing portion now. Um, just some, some preliminary um, overviews, just some housekeeping notes. The restrooms, of course, are outside. If you follow around the corner, you'll run into the restrooms as well. There are some snacks on the table outside of the door. Um, also, if you have an opportunity, please, while you're here, we want to make sure that we get accurate information for everyone who's had the opportunity to come and participate with us. There are sign-in sheets outside of the door on the table to the right. Please make sure before you leave today to sign in. Um, the purpose today uh, is the Metro Nashville government has partnered with us, Griffin and Strong PC. We are a law and public policy consulting firm out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it is our, our duty, is our, our, our charge, our obligation right now to the city to conduct a disparity study and comprehensive analysis of the metro contracting process. The 2018 disparity study will examine participation on metro Nashville contracts by small minority women and disadvantaged business enterprises. It is the metro Nashville government's intent to render a diverse and equitable business environment that will benefit all of its vendors and ensure that public contracting opportunities are equally available to small minority women and disadvantaged businesses. Our firm has been charged with reviewing Metro's procurement policies and practices, analyzing pertinent and statistical data, collecting and analyzing anecdotal evidence, and presenting findings and recommendations for this study. To achieve this, we partner with several local firms, including Atlas Management Corporation, a local staffing firm that assisted us with door-to-door -door outreach, the Maynard Group, which is doing our anecdotal interviews, represented today by Jeff McKissick. I don't know if Jeff is in the room. If you could just wave at everybody there in the back. Uh, and then we also have with us Harpeth Court Reporting that's partnered to do our court reporting services for our three, and this is our third public hearing. Um, we have also done, uh, as to this point, we're in the process of anecdotal interviews. We've done an online 
survey. Um, we're doing a variety of different data collection methods, and this is just one of the most important parts of this process, which is our anecdotal, that we want to make sure that we get into the community and hear directly from you guys. So the purpose of this hearing is to hear candid testimony about your experiences, both positive and negative, and I want to stress that both positive and negative uh, experience that you have ex endured with Metro, either in doing business or attempting to do business with the Metro Nashville government. The anecdotes of business owners, activists, and local organizations will help us in determining whether the Metro Nashville government or the Nashville private marketplace have discriminated either actively or passively against minority women or disadvantaged businesses. We want to emphasize that these testimonies do not have to solely consist of negative experiences, but we're also welcome and pleased to report any and all positive feedback on Metro's operation within the business community. Griffin and Strong is not interested in, in influencing your expressions whatsoever. We want to make sure that you all are comfortable to tell you exactly what your experiences have been. However, we, want, we seek a clear and honest image of your experience, good and bad, which we intend to relay as a part of our overall study process. Now, just a disclaimer that everything said during this hearing uh, will be available as a part of public record. As we noted, we have a court reporter here who is keeping track of everything that's being said. There will also be recordings. Uh, this will not be made publishable outside of in an instance of there being some sort of legal action. Uh, but we wanted to make you all aware that this is being recorded, your words and your, your uh, in some cases, possibly your action. Uh, also, there will be an audio recording made available, and that will go along with the public record. Um, as to the process, I want to make sure that we know that we are, as we want to, do, to create an honest and comfortable environment where everyone can share their honest and direct feedback, please make sure that we uh, organize ourselves and, and conduct ourselves in a respectful manner. Uh, we have the microphone here in the front. As you all are motioned to the front, and I will be facilitating this uh, hearing today, as you all you know, motion to me that you would like to speak or give comment, we will motion for you to the front. Please approach to the microphone here to my left and your right. Um, and you start by beginning with your name, the organization that you represent, uh, or the business that you represent to make sure that we accurately maintain and uh, reflect what's being said on the record. Um, outside of that, um, I want to give an opportunity to give notice to our CEO, Rodney K. Strong, who's here in the front as well. Did you have anything that you wanted to say? Uh, I just want to say that uh, it's really important that we get candid information from everybody about your experiences with the uh, Metro Nashville government. Uh, this is the first uh, study that's been conducted in 14 years. We did a previous study for Metro that we, most of the data was from 2004. I think we ultimately released it in 2005, early 2005. And so it's really important that uh, we get as much uh, testimony of what's going on in the metro area as we can, and so we would appreciate uh, as much candid testimony as you're willing to give, and we thank you for it. Um, you get with that? He told you what the yeah. okay, okay. Uh, so I will invite volunteers now at this moment. If you all have testimony that you would wish to give. Um, please motion to me by raising your hand. I will direct you towards the front. And also, I just want to remind you, please make sure that even in the language that we use, that we're respectful, that we refrain from being harsh towards one another in this gathering. Um, so with that being said, I will kick off formally our comment process. Uh, if anyone is willing to begin the testimony today, please motion, and I will direct you towards the front. And again, please begin with your name and the name of the organization or business that you represent. Uh, my name is Alexander Cord Jr. Uh, I used to be the president of IT Solutions by Design, uh, IT consulting company here in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, that was incorporated in 2009 here. Uh, also represent the NAACP Economic Development Committee. Uh, my experience with Metro Nashville government has been almost a nightmare on M Street. Okay. Uh, I have not been treated fairly. I believe the whole process that is put in place through the procurement non-discrimination is basically a lot of words and no action. In fact, uh, we spent su a substantial amount of time reviewing the disparity studies from 1999 2004 in regards to the recommendation made by Griffin Strom and, and Mason Tillman 
and the, and the Nashville city has not stepped up to the plate to buy into the recommendations that have been put out by the consulting firms. Uh, the good faith discussion requires people that want to have a good faith discussion. Now, Nashville has, has a history of being non-good faith. In fact, Nashville have a history of being a Jim Crow city. And that carried over, all right? They were brought in, the study showed in 1999 and 2004 that Nashville had statistically discriminated against black and women-owned businesses. And the re recommendations were a list of probably 30 or 40 pages each that was supposed to be implemented by the city. But the city chose not to implement them, okay? And the results are what we have today. Still a city that discriminates against black and, and women-owned businesses. It's not my data that I testify to. It's Metro Dashville's own data. The disparity studies, the benchmarks that have sub sub subsequently been released by Griffin and Strong continue to show that the city has not had the will to do the right thing. Now, I'm going to talk about my cases, and there are three or four cases. I started my business. I had a, uh, a Metro Nashville Public Schools issued an RFP. I was selected as a subcontractor with Metro Nashville uh, Schools with Rico Industries to provide e-cartridges and supplies for Metro Nashville Public Schools. I was the, sub, uh, the uh, subcontractor. We signed a subcontract agreement. I was supposed to get 7.15% of that opportunity, okay? Now, the initial quote on that opportunity was $1.6 million, but yet they wrote the contract for $5 million, eventually spent $7 million, and I got exactly $2,000 worth of revenue, okay? All right? Now, not only did they do that, Metro Nashville government used a reference contract issue RICO, a $7 million, no bid contract, off of that reference contract where I am the subcontractor. Okay? Now, I'm not getting the opportunity that they offered me over there. So, I find out, just through the grapevine and doing the necessary investigation, and finding out that they let that contract to RICO. I notified the business assistance office that, hey, I'm not even being used over here. How are you going to allow this contract to go? Well, they tell me Metro Nashville Public Schools is completely separate from Metro Nashville government, yet they use the reference contract to issue that contract to RICO, and I'm totally excluded. So that's my nightmare on M Street, and it don't stop there, okay? I participated in a uh, 1000 it was supposed to be a $1,000 single bid for storage area networks. Now, I worked for 38 years in IT industry, 21 years for IBM, 11 years for Hitachi Data System. I was IT director for Tennessee Department of Labor for one year, and I was uh, IT director for Tennessee Bureau of Investigation for one and a half years. So I know a little bit about technology. So there was a $1,000, supposed to be a single bid for $100,000. I attend the vendor conference. I give my card to one of the other primes. I knew they were going to be it. So as supposed to be part of the requirement, they're supposed to reach out to three minority vendors. Now, I'm certified as a storage area engineer. In fact, one of the first people ever certified to do storage area engineering with Hitachi Data System, one of the largest storage companies in the city. I tell the prime that I can do all of these things except one or two areas. You think he reached out and had a good faith discussion with me? In fact, he ran and found three other com companies that couldn't even do the work. And when I complained about it, nothing happened. He says I complained. What I did beforehand, since the, the prime didn't contact me back, I sent a note to the business assistance office telling the business assistance office that they could not use my company's name as a good faith discussion. All right? So they awarded the contract to the prime, initially $116,000. So I go back and I, and I ask through Freedom of Information request to provide the documentation associated with that bid. Well, they bid it. 
I looked at the three companies that were associated. They didn't even play in the arena. Not only did I find out that they got awarded for $100,000, the contract got increased to $1 million, and then $10 million. This is basically a sole source bid. Again, I complain. They tell me tough luck, okay? That's the kind of luck that I've had. Now, I've had one contract when I first opened my business with Metro Nashville Police Department, okay? I ended up able to fulfill that contract for about $70,000, okay? Now, but it didn't go as smooth as silk because I partnered up with one of the prime contractors to provide hardware. I provide hardware, software, and networking for a system to go into the laboratory information management system for the police department. Well, initially, the, the, the prime wanted HP hardware, which I was an HP reseller. I said, no problem. I put together the quote. We submitted the bid. But Metro says they standardize on Dell. I said, no problem. I'm authorized to resell Dell, okay? But I had to rebid the whole process, okay? To, and basically, because they standardize on Dell, have a Dell contract, I had to drive my profit margin down just to capture the opportunity. So that didn't go as well as possible. And there have been other instances where I get late notification. They're supposed to reach out to you, give you enough time to have a good faith discussion, but you get a notification a half, a day and a half before the bid is due, where you don't have a chance to prepare. No one is checking. John Irvin used to work, work over at the business assistance office. He was the only one that used to call me and say, Alex, did you have a good faith discussion with this vendor? And I would say, no. And he would tell them, you got to start all over. I haven't had anybody else call me to confirm that we had a good faith discussion. So what I'm telling you is that there's a lot of words on paper. And the city has not stepped up and demonstrated the political will to do the right, eh, the right thing. And as a result, we get the same results we had back in 1999. <laughs> now, you don't have to believe me. I got the documentation for anybody that wants to see it. Okay, so all I got to say is that we have to stop this nightmare and we have to stop the bad or uh, ill intentions of a city that will not grow up and step up to the, be the IT city that it, they claim they want to be. If you want to be a city where you have diversity and you recognize the strength of individuals and their expertise, what they bring to the table, do the right thing, okay? You're forcing people out of the business that bring years of experience into this opportunity, okay? I have demonstrated through my ability with IBM, recognition at SE awards, sales personal awards, but yet I come back to my own city and I'm treated like I don't know what I'm doing. So that's my experience with the business assistance office and the procurement non-discrimination. If they do the right thing, they would have implemented the recommendations that the consultants, too, told them to do. Look at it. They haven't even, come, they haven't even done 10%. I bid my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Corey, is there anyone else who would like to give testimony about their experience, either in doing business with Metro, attempting to do business with Metro, or developing a small business here in uh, Metro Nashville? Again, we welcome all testimony, both positive and negative experiences. Um, anyone, anyone? Um, for this hearing, we're not soliciting questions. We will be around afterwards to discuss if there are any specific questions you all have for us. Um, but this hearing is designed specifically just for testimony and commentary from the business community about their experiences and what they've endured, whether it be in their attempts to do business with Metro or in growing a business here in Nashville. Yes, ma'am. Well, for the sake of the court reporter, we want to make sure everyone's being picked up. I'm sorry.
Good evening. My name is Sandra Potter, and uh, we have been in business for 11 years. Our company does post-construction final cleaning, and we're a janitorial uh, company. We have tried to do business with Metro on the past, and yes, I agree with this gentleman. They intend to have good faith with you, to do business with you, and there is not a follow-up. Did you contact that company? Well, they just write your name that they did contact you so they can get the contract. But did you, did you give them the contract? Did you pay them? Did you follow up? No, they just got the name and they got the contract. That happens to me. And if they give you the job or they intend to give you the job, they give you the worst job that they don't want, the one that is the nightmare. And what are you do as a small business? You are, you are set to fail. They know you are going to fail. And what do they do? They call you at the last minute, three or four days before, bid on it. Get your numbers up there. And there is no follow-up. Was, I was very disappointed that I intended, I did the right thing, and it didn't work. Um, another thing, I think that the city has grown enough that it's time for uh, the metro to share the pie with other big companies that come from out of state, other big people. Why is it that we have to have the monopoly to one janitorial company for the city of metro? It is a time to divide the pie, the north, the south, this county, that county, the east or the west, so other companies have the opportunity because it's a tight circle to break. It's just us. And I just think that us, as Latino women trying to do business with Metro, uh, it's very hard to break that circle. It's like, it's just us. And wherever you meet them, they are the same people, the same people. It is hard to break that circle. I think it's time to divide the city. We're big enough now. Why is it that we have monopoly that only this company has this contract? Yes or no? Just this company has this contract. It's time to divide the pie. That's my opinion. I was very disappointed that that's the only company that I had to go through for me to work in Metro. Nobody else, I had to go through them. Why? Because they hold the whole pie. And that I think it's time to break it. And I think it's time to share it. That's all I have to say. And they need to follow up. When there is that good faith conversations, those good faith contracts, follow up that they actually did. When did you uh, send them the invitation for the solicitation? Was that on time? What happened? Why is it that you did quit doing business with him? What was the reason? Oh no, but they got your name and they got the contract. The rest, who cares? That happens to me and that's all I have to say about that. And I wish to continue doing with business with Metro. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to give testimony this evening? Again, about experiences either in developing a business, uh, doing business with Metro, attempting to do business with Metro, uh, adhering to good faith requirements. I mean, any uh, area of conversation related to this, we definitely welcome your feedback. We want to hear from all businesses about what their experiences have been, uh, ways that they believe the process could be better. Uh, we definitely want to make sure that your opportunity to be heard is, is counted. Yes, sir. And again, please start with your name and the name of the organization or business. My name is Dan Lane, and currently I'm the owner of ABL Realty Services. But I'm going to go back into some years because in 1974, and I'm taking you back some, Alex, even, you know, and I'm not going to talk for the last three or four years because basically I gave up trying to do business with Metro many years ago. I started an office supply business in 1974 and ran it and owned it until 1986. And at that time, it was a nightmare to do business with Metro. And over a 10-year time period, I doubt I've sold them $10,000 worth of business. 
I had purchasing director come from Atlanta and say, I'll do more business with you than your own city would do, and that did happen. At that time, I knew an office supply dealer in Arkansas who had the state contract because he knew Bill Clinton. He had two buddies over in North Carolina that had all the business for North Carolina A&T because uh, uh, Jackson was very active over there. Now, my whole thing, and I think I've said this before, it's not the process, in my opinion. This city, not only the metro, but I'm saying the private community also, do not have the will to do business with black folks or women and so forth. In my opinion, they're all greedy and they want it for themselves. And if you do anything, work on how can you begin to change attitude so that the political will be do that? Because if you, to me, the law's on the book. They play game with where well, we don't have this or don't have that in terms of legally and so forth. And in my opinion, you're wasting time if you're working. I know one of our council people was talking about coming up with some new laws, uh, uh, Councilman Scott Davis, that thing to give people the reason to do business. To me, that's a waste of time. What can you do psychologically and so forth to get this community, in my opinion, and stakeholders in this community, not only the city, the council, and so forth, but the Chamber of Commerce and other uh, uh, major business here to say we are going to share business with, in, in, with all diverse group here. It's lack of a political will here. And I'm gonna say one other thing too, and, 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 and I'm an advocate, and I think also I don't think we have advocated enough in the last 15 to 20 years here. I think we need more advocacy and more direct action uh, to force this city to reckon with the problem. And it, I go back and I think about during the time when it, during the Civil Rights Movement. It was only when we had people like H. Ralph Brown say, let's burn, baby, burn the Stokely Carmack to say that, that we passed the Fair Housing Act and a lot of other things happened. And I think that needs to happen here before you're going to get any type of improvement in purchases from minority or black businesses in this city. Thank you again. Is there anyone else who'd be willing to share their experiences either in building a business, developing a business as a small or minority business here, um, navigating the process, uh, any advocates in the room who would like to give feedback about their experiences working between Metro as an advocate uh, for the business communities? I mean, all positive and negative feedback is welcomed by all parties. We want to make sure your voices are heard. Anyone, anyone? Thank you, sir. Good evening. I am Roger Ligon with ICF Builders. And I have no complaints because we bid Metro work and we do Metro work. We're general contractors here in the city. I do think that there are some things that's needed. Back several years ago, we, right now, when you first came and did the first study, we'd already had one. This is the third study, I think, that this city has had. The problem that I have with the, this being the third study is that every time it ends up being, you've got to go through a certain number of months of this or that of race neutral again. And unless we have some punishment for the ones that play the games, and, and, and let me say that they're ones that play the games. I, I don't bid as a sub anymore because I realize that the games get played. So I don't bid as a sub. We, fortunately, thank God, we're, we're of the size that we can bid as a general contractor on occasion. But unless there's a punishment for the games that are being played, you're going to write the same report again. You're going to show that there is disparity, and we're going to go on down the road. Back when Bill Purcell was mayor, 
we tried to do a commercial non-discrimination policy with him, and it went down to third and final reading on his last night in office. And he walked away, and they did nothing. And the next mayor came in, and they passed one, but it's weak. It's weak as water. And as an end result, everybody that's the big boys get to play the game. I think that's totally unfair. I don't blame the, the BAO. Because they're put there to do a job. I worked in state government and ran the small business department for the state of Tennessee. And let me be candid with you guys. Their job is to keep the natives from getting restless. Not to make changes. To keep the natives from getting restless. I spent eight years trying to do that and then decided this is not what I need to be about. So, Rodney, when you do the report this time, if there's not going to be race conscious programs in it, it very well needs to have some degrees of punishment for the people that abuse the program. Unless you do that, you've got the same thing that's happening to Kua, that's happening to the little lady here that was back. Unless those changes are made, we're going to have this problem, and we'll be right back here five, six years from now talking the same thing all over again. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to share feedback about their experiences either doing business with Metro, positive and negative, uh, also in their experiences trying to develop a business? I want to also make note that we also are looking for opportunities if you have had experience not specifically with Metro but in the private sector that you would want to share about your opportunities that you've attempted to do business outside of just the Metro PNP program. Those are valid to our study as well. Um, but I want to make sure everyone is familiar and has opportunity to share. Were you about this? Anyone else? Anyone? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Sam Kirk, and I stand tonight representing uh, the Bordeaux Business Coalition. Uh, I've been involved uh, with business for a long time. I've talked to many business owners. And it's a frustrating process. Not only is it frustrating, it's an unfair process when you bid almost knowing that the hope of you being able to obtain fair opportunity is not there. I know of a couple of instances, and I don't want to talk to them specifically because they weren't my businesses, but I've talked to the business owners where they felt the bidding process was not right. They felt even though they were included on a contract, I do want this on the record. They were included on the contract. The contract was secured because of the minority participation that they had. And it shows in their particular increase in revenue as if the money came to their company. However, if you really go back and pull back the covers, it was more of a pass-through. So here this company is. They're being used. They've shown that there's all this increase in business. But really, it was more of a of, a, of a, an opportunity for the prime to be able to use this business and then actually actually benefit from the business by them paying the prime back for whatever products or services they were providing. So there are some instances that I know personally in this city that are like that. This is why. So my statement is really not about the past. I think that what happens to us, we spend a lot of time focused on the past. What I really, the next thing I want on the record is we're sitting on the verge right now and this is why we formed the Bordeaux Business Coalition. TDOT, which is a state project, is getting ready to come down Clarksville Highway. There's all kind of money being ready to be spent up and down Clarksville Highway in development. Uh, TDOT is at our office in two weeks because I've met with them on several occasions to say, be fair if there are opportunities for small, minority, women-owned contractors, businesses to use you know, and get benefit from this huge contract that's getting ready to happen be fair and provide some of those dollars to those businesses. The next major thing that's getting ready to happen are two major things. We've got the soccer and we have the transit. Nine billion dollars is getting ready to be spent. So what I'd rather spend our time doing right now, and this is what our committee is really committed to doing, is let's position these business owners so that they can be prepared, so that they can actually go and bid properly, be equipped, have the capacity to do some of these contracts that are being offered, and then if they still are not offered opportunity, then there does need to be a watchdog agency 
that steps in there and there needs to be some recourse for people not using or totally misusing small minority disadvantaged businesses. So again, we can talk about the past, we're not gonna be able to change that. But Nashville is the it city. There are billions of dollars getting ready to be spent. I'd rather spend our time, and this is where I'm gonna spend my time, is making sure that the business community as far as minority businesses and those business owners uh, uh, will be prepared. And if there is no penalty, as Roger just said, that's an unfair thing that, you know, they just, yeah, so what, I didn't do it. And there's absolutely, so it needs to be a watchdog agency of some sort, maybe from the business community, maybe from others. There needs to be some type of watchdog agency that is able to analyze, review these contracts, make sure they are being properly administered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to give commentary this evening? Uh, I know that, you know, we have a lot of people with a lot of experiences, a lot of perspective. We want to make sure all those things are gathered today. They're all valid to us. Uh, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to share, of course, with your experiences, either in the private sector or in the public doing business with Metro, uh, bidding or attempting to bid, working as a subcontractor or working as a prime contractor, all are relevant to us this evening. Yes, sir. And for, for you uh, coming back, like I said, also begin with your name, name of the organization you represent as well. Uh, my name is Don Majors. Uh, I am currently the chairman of the National NAACP Economic Development Committee. And we've been focused for the past year on primarily looking at the underutilization of minority and women owned businesses here in this city for the, not only the past year, but for the past five years. We've uh, submitted a lot of uh, FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests to the Purchase Department, the Finance Department, to get numbers that would verify what we're about to say uh, in the future about what's happening here in the city. Uh, currently, uh, I, we've spoken with, uh, what's your name? Sterling. We spoke with Sterling and Rodney. Uh, we looked at the Mason Tillman disparity study and its recommendations uh, from 1999. We looked at Rodney's disparity study from 2005, looked at those recommendations. And they, they do recognize the need for some type of penalty or oversight committee. Both of those studies recommended that to Metro, but as uh, Dan said, there's no political will to, in, to implement these things. And it doesn't make sense. It, we, we don't have anybody in this city that's willing to implement the things that these, guys, these uh, companies come up with. Now, they're not unreasonable uh, recommendations. Why is it not happening? Now, that's the big question. Why is it not happening? Uh, Griffin and Strong have done, since the 2008 uh, procurement non-discrimination policy was implemented. They've done three benchmark studies to uh, reflect on whether uh, the PNP is working and whether it's uh, gaining any traction, making anything happen for minority businesses. I got a copy of one here. This is the, 20, the last one they did. They all say the same thing. They all say the same thing. Minority and women-owned businesses are being significantly underutilized. Now, who do we blame for that? Now, if you keep getting the, getting the same studies year after year, and you do nothing about it, uh, once again, it's about political will. Nobody's willing to step up and say, we're gonna do the right thing. This city is too large and making too much, there's too money, much money being made to not to feel like it can be shared among these small businesses. Now, I, uh, I want to say this about the uh, procurement department and the BAO. Some of those implementations require an additional FTE, uh, full-time employees. They are short-staffed and short-handed. I know this personally, and I've mentioned it to Michelle and anybody else that would listen, that hopefully in the next budget cycle that they would provide them with four more FTEs to implement some of these, I know that they're not 
following up on some of these uh, good faith uh, efforts that some of these primes are ducking out on because they don't have the personnel. But that shouldn't be an excuse. I said it needs to step forward and say, hey, we're going to finance the number of personnel needed to do the right thing down in the business assistance office so this program can work. But it's never going to work if we don't uh, implement some of these uh, uh, recommendations that they make. I, I, they're not way off base. I mean, these are common sense re recommendations that nobody is willing to implement. It's crazy. It just doesn't make any sense. I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Is there anyone else who's willing to give their testimony this evening on the record about doing business with Metro, their attempts at uh, owning and operating or growing a smaller minority business here in Nashville um, or operating in the private sector as well? Uh, all of those are valid to us. We want to make sure you have the opportunity to give your feedback. I also want to remind you all, if you came in late and haven't had the opportunity, please make sure that you sign in before leaving this evening uh, out in the front. Um, Astrid, correct me if I'm wrong. There are comment and question sheets on the table outside are those for questions to the mayor's office or yes. okay well they're on the table directly across where the water is there are comment and question sheets that you all may submit uh leave behind here for the mayor's office as well yes ma'am okay come on no no i'm done i'm done <laughs> Hi, I'm MJ Batson, and my company's Make a Mark. And I came to this tonight. I didn't actually know what this was. Um, I just thought it, I should come because I'm a woman and I'm black, so okay. So I'm here. And so listening to people talk, um, I realized I will share about my experiences doing business in Nashville. I haven't necessarily done business directly with Metro, um, but you said private is fine. Um, so I've had some great experiences with people who are kind, awesome, amazing, supporting people, supportive people. Call them up. They want to help you. Dan Lane is one of those people, nicest man ever. Um, and then there have been experiences that have been terrible. Um, I've had people refuse to shake my hand. I've had people tell me. Um, there was one opportunity, not opportunity, one happening where I had someone say, who do you think you are? God. Um, this is more of a comment on just people, I think. And it was just all these different things that happened. And I was like, I'm truly shocked. I'm a native. I grew up here. I'm from here. I left for a while and came back. But I was dumbfounded, continue to be dumbfounded, actually, um, by the range of experiences that I have. Some are positive. Some are extremely negative. And um, to the point where you are like, whoa, like, is it, is it supposed to be this hard to, to run a business? Is it, should it be this hard? And um, you ask yourself, is it because I'm a female? Is it because I'm a minority? Is it because I'm this, that, or the other? Is it because I'm young? Um, I feel at times it's because I'm young that there's you know certain things that happen. And I'm like, first off, you should be excited that I'm young. Um, that's great. And age is relative. Um, I think I have an old soul, but you know. So I've uh, been running. I've been running a company for a while. Well, I've been. I started my first company when I was 13. I tutored math to college and high school students because um, math is my jam. So you know, I've been doing these sorts of things for a long time. But this current thing that I do is. It's been the hardest version of entrepreneurship that I've ever um, been a part of. And I'm grateful for it because, like, hey, I learn a lot of lessons while I do things. But there are times where you think, wow, like, this is the city that I'm from. Like, what? Like, what's going on here? Like, I don't understand why it's so hard um, and to do good and to do work. And so um, I had a meeting once where I was told, Actually, I was told the city's not going to be a part of this until you don't need the city, um, until it doesn't look good that they're not. And I stopped and I said, "Wait, what? <laughs> did you just like? Did you say that to me?" Um, and I'm a pretty upbeat person, and you know, I'm 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 quite positive. But that to me was a blow, which is why when I don't need your help is when you you're gonna 
appear. Um, and for you to blatantly tell me that, it's like, whoa. <laughs> okay, um, so what do you do? And um, I have a litany of things. I've had small businesses that support, um, have been supportive that, you know, if you ask for something, they'll say yes. And small businesses, I will say, try to help each other. Um, that's not the problem. I think that the problem is more from a, um, a macro level where it's, you know, I can't speak on the city as a whole because I don't know everyone that operates within the city or that's doing business. And um, I do know that I've had some experiences that have been tragic, um, but I am resilient. So, you know, being an entrepreneur and a businesswoman, you kind of have to be. But yeah, so I thought I'd come up here and say something to speak from a different generation's perspective. As a young person doing business in Metro, I think that, um, I think I should be encouraged at every corner. I don't think anyone should refuse to shake my hand or make nasty comments towards me um, and or tell me that they won't be a part of it until it doesn't matter. You know, so that to me is, you know, there's a lot of layers in that. So that's all I got. Um, and everyone that's in here that has a business, good luck. Um, I'll support you if I can. With me? Yeah, just <laughs> I thought we weren't asking questions. Come on. Only, only for clarity's sake. First, I want to okay. thank you as a representative of young people. Oh, I, I don't want to say that. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> but I uh, just as a, a quick follow-up, um, could you share with us the type of business that you run and operate now, some of your past experiences in that business, um, how long you've been operating that business here in Nashville? Okay. Um, so we started formally in 2016, um, and we're incorporated in Tennessee, though we started out of New York. Um, we are a tech company um, of sorts, but we also have a development side of what we've been working on for a long time. But technically, we are a tech company, a tech startup. Um, and we are focused on um, increasing opportunity, um, particularly in areas where it doesn't exist within education, technology, culture, and community. So the things that we do right now, we have um, initiatives that are STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. I say it so much that mm -hmm. I, I'm like, I shouldn't say it like that because some people don't know, and that's fine. Um, STEAM is just an acronym, and basically it's an initiative to increase representation in um, STEM, mm -hmm. STEAM areas um, in our world, programming, coding, and um, education initiatives, and that includes young people and elderly. Great, great, thank you. Okay, bye, yeah, that's it. Great, perfect. Yes, sir, you may reapproach. Oh, I'm sorry, were you, sir, in the back, are you approaching? Yes, sir, you may approach, please. How do I raise that? I was stuck in the famous uh, Nashville traffic coming down here from uh, um, Franklin. So gridlock all the way around. Where is that transit we were promised 25 years ago? We would have so many more minority businesses in town if some of these uh, projects that we had that were promised over the years had come to fruition. I'm coming there right now. Thank you. My name is Devinder Sandhu. Uh, I'm an environmental and civil engineering consultant, Sandhu Consultants, S-A-N-D-H-U, the vendor Sandhu. If you go to the Fort Negley Greer RFP that was put out recently, you can uh, see a lot of history about me and my efforts to participate in business in Nashville. Um, so let me go to that. I'll start with that first because that's the most recent in people's, uh, people's minds. Uh, I approached the city of Nashville Metro Parks to do a public-private partnership to develop Greer Stadium into a community uh, sports facility back five years ago when the Sounds were first planning on uh, moving out to the new facility. At that time, I was told to bring a proposal to them, which I did. And a few weeks later, I was told that, uh, thank you very much, but we decided to put this out to the public for developers to give an idea on how to develop that site. 
I had people approach me to put my proposal, flesh it out, and be competitive with some of the other developers. We were given all the usual point systems and requirements and everything else on how to present the proposal. We put together a team that was 50% minority. When the score was finally put out of the five qualified uh, team, five proposers that qualified, we finished four out of five in minority participation. Our minority package, our diversity package was written by Mr. Don Harden, who was part of our team, who helped Metro write the diversity package. Despite that, we finished four out of five. We thought we had the expert of the field helping us with that. All of you know who got the bid, and those folks are friends of mine, so I'll not say anything disparaging about them. Uh, my son works for that company also, as an aside. But I did protest that decision to Metro. And my protest was mainly stemmed from the fact that I was the only, I was the only minority that submitted a bid on that development. And I finished four out of five. The reason given to me by the BAO or the procurement office was the minority status of the principal doesn't matter to us. The minority status of the principal does not matter to us. It didn't matter if everybody in there was a minority in my program. If we're all partners equally, and that's all we had, equal partners, and we proposed, it would not have mattered because we were the principal. They were looking at scoring the so-called diversity package, which we still haven't figured out how to score. So what the hell is going on? So let me give you a little bit of history of what happened in Nashville over the last 25 years, real quickly. Before desegregation, I, I was here just before desegregation to come to college. Before desegregation, we had a very vibrant Jefferson Street. We had minority businesses that competed equally, building the black community. Attorneys, doctors, plumbers, engineers, dentists, accountants, bricklayers, concrete, concrete for, folks. You name it, they did it. After desegregation, and once Metro government was formed, and Metro government started handing out bids, these vibrant minority businesses in North Nashville started dying out. You can see that happening out there now. You can see the remnants of that now. You can look at some of the buildings out there that were vibrant communities. Movie houses, jazz theaters, jazz uh, uh, places, restaurants, gone. And the minority community got marginalized. And that is why we don't have enough minority businesses right now to participate. There is not in this town an effort to build that up through some kind of mentorship program, through some kind of apprenticeship program, to some kind of partnering. 2% participation by blacks in this community is shameful. It is shameful. I come from Africa, so I consider myself black. I was born in Kenya. I'm more black than some black people in here. I got more blood of Africa in me than some of you guys do. Okay, coming from Africa, I know how Africans were treated by the British rulers. Third class citizens, third class in their own continent. Indians, us, we were second class citizens. We had schools that had walls. The blacks had to, uh, had to learn under trees out in the open. And of course the British had the best. I didn't think I'd see that in this country. I didn't see I see that in this country in this century, but I'm seeing it. Nashville has to be better at turning this around. 
we have to turn this around by empowering these young kids. And there's some brilliant young minority kids coming up. But they get slapped down very quickly once they try to get into the, into the workforce. What are we going to do to change it? What are you guys who are writing these reports going to do to change it? I haven't seen a solution. I see reports that don't really report what's happening out there. So I have a lot on my chest, not just from a minority standpoint, from the standpoint of education, standpoint of equality, standpoint of what's just and what's fair. Let's grow together. Let's raise all the boats. This rising tide in here is sinking some, raising others. We should be raising all the boats. Devinder Sandhu, Sandhu Consultants. I'll be at the next one also. One of the areas that uh, I've had discussion with several uh, companies, uh, both private and, and public, in regards to financing. Um, as an IT company, uh, I purchase goods and services through distributors. Cinex Corporation, some of the large distributing corporations. They offer third-party financing, which basically says that it's not necessarily my credit that they're looking at, but they look at my ability to deliver the goods and services to a particular client of mine. And based on the client's capability, they would determine whether or not they would allow me to do what we call a shared purchase order. Well, shared purchase order for a small company is critical because what it does is allow you to take on larger opportunities, okay, if you have the capability to do it. Now, I asked many corporations around here to allow me to use shared or joint third party purchasing agreements, okay, to be able to finance larger opportunities than what I can understand. Now, this is not necessarily from the BAO because I never asked this question to BAO, but at other governmental agencies in the city, when I asked to be able to use those, they told me that if I used those, they would just consider me as a manufacturing rep, okay? that I wouldn't be representing myself by using the third party financial tool, okay? And therefore, I, I wouldn't be able to be considered a minority. Well, one of the recommendations that your company made as well as Tillman was looking at some type of financial assistance to help small businesses grow and, and, and handle opportunities that they may not qualify on their own based on startup capability. And that's why so many small businesses die around here is because, first of all, larger corporations won't give them an opportunity because they consider them a financial risk. Second is that when you go to your government to seek assistance, they tell you you can't use these instruments, which is vital for the health and well-being of a small startup company. Because what they do is they look at my ability, my, my third-party finance, look at my ability to deliver the products and services that I'm certified for. So I had to go through training and certification. I just can't deliver products that I don't know anything about. But they allow me to use that as a vehicle. And m most of the businesses I talk to, both public and private, do not consider that as a vehicle that they, they can use. So those are some of the issues that impact small businesses as they start up. It's not necessarily a metro national problem, but it was for some of the governmental agencies that I spoke with. But it's a problem in general when you first get off the ground because I had 38 years in the IT industry. You know, I've been named SE of the year. I've been, I have so many awards on my pillar, but that only accounts for the company where I worked before. 21 years with IBM, 11 years with Hitachi, two years with Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, two years with Tennessee Department of Labor in leadership as IT director. But yet, when I start up and I show my credentials and my resume, okay, they don't give me credit for that. And that's, that's one of the vital points that allow businesses to take on slightly larger opportunities. One of the first opportunities that I had, and this was through federal government, um, FEMA came to me. I had just opened my doors, 
nine months, had an opportunity to sell some, uh, a lot of computer hardware and software. $400,000 right out of the bat. And my credit limit was 125000 I tried every mechanism I could. And this is basically just buying the product that they specify. They would not let me use third party financing, okay, to do it. It had to be my financing. So what I'm asking is federal government sometimes don't allow you, but state and local government should allow you to use third party financing tools, okay, to be able to accept large opportunities where you are certified. So I have contacted a number of of business people in the area to ask them to look at developing that kind of financial lending institution to support this because now what they can do is these people can come to them for assistance, get certified in their product and skill set, and then they can look at the risk. And typically these are, are typically three to nine months type of tools. Those are the type of tools that need to be implemented, whatever program comes out to support small businesses starting up because it is critical. Uh, for you to have an opportunity to, to not be stymied by your own limited uh, capability, especially as, as coming out of school, right? So, you know, 38 years of, of, of all kind of accreditation didn't mean a lot to a lot of companies, but it should have because it had demonstrated my ability to work in the largest corporation in the world and deliver, and deliver repeatedly to stay in business and stay on top for 38 years. So. That's one of the mechanisms I think we, did, we have to have. In addition to infrastructure, we have to have penalties, we have to have fines, and we have to have oversight. And based on national history, we need tremendous amount of oversight to make sure that the people running the ship are going in the right direction instead of heading back south. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else who's willing to give testimony this evening? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tremaine Anderson. I'm one of the principals of the Be Love Foundation. I'm a resident of Dayton, well, resident of Dayton Ohio, originally. A graduate of Vanderbilt University uh, organization, we primarily focus on providing occupational empowerment for individuals in transition, specifically speaking, homeless veterans, incarcerated felons, as well as rising juniors and seniors. As well, we know, you know, upon graduation, everybody's not going to college, you know, they're not going to trade school, you know, some are going directly into the workforce, some are not even going to graduate. You know, so our organization focuses on making certain they have the tools and the skills necessary to be successful. You know, you, you hear in the community, on the news, you know, from a lot of politicians, you know, what the need is, obviously, to address some of the, you know, the mayhem that exists, you know, in the streets of Nashville, Davidson County, and the surrounding communities. You know, well, I'm here to put everybody on notice that, you know, your service provider, you know, is, in fact, you know, available. You know, I'm here. I'm a 20-plus year environmental health and safety professional, played football at Vanderbilt, degree in chemical engineering, Got in and out in four years, you know, so I'm utilizing, you know, my expertise to provide this service for citizens in transition. Um, working with, you know, Department of Corrections, working with, you know, Tennessee Prison Outreach Ministry, you know, have yet to really solidify my position as far as, you know, Metro government is concerned, you know, but again, I want to make it known that, you know, the outreach is here and, you know, I'm very much, you know, committed, you know, as these gentlemen and young lady sitting in front of me is to make certain that, you know, we're changing, you know, the face of the community. We're empowering our youth, you know, because they are our future, you know, so we have to give them an alternative to what they see today, an alternative to the streets. Everybody's not going to be that stellar athlete and have that, you know, full ride scholarship to, you know, Division One university, you know, so it's our responsibility to make certain that, again, we equip them, you know, with the tools so they can be successful. So they then, you know, can lead by example to their siblings, as well as, you know, making a stance, you know, in, in front of, you know, some of the elders, if you will, that exist, you know, within the community that may be, you know, resisting, you know, to their rise, you know, because a lot of them are misguided, you know, they're without purpose, you know, we need to reestablish, you know, their identity, but it starts within. And 
when we know better, you know, obviously we have a responsibility to do better, you know, so, you know, I'm taking, you know, full ownership, you know, of my responsibility as a black business owner, I do business, you know, under the auspice also of TDA Enterprise and through TDA Enterprise, I provide turnkey safety services. That's program development, assessments, inspections, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, implementation, training, um, you know, gentleman who spoke earlier, he mentioned Don Harding, a good friend of mine. I'm actually going to be providing OSHA 10 hour training for his staff on Friday, you know, utilizing Martha O'Brien Center. So I'm working with, you know, the affiliates, you know, within the community as a nonprofit organization, demonstrating, you know, synergy, you know, because obviously, you know, we're more resourceful, you know, as a people than we are just as, you know, an individual. And, you know, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a unified front. It's going to take everybody being committed, you know, regardless of, you know, what your your discipline is in terms of, you know, the services actually provided. You know, there's going to be some similarity, some commonality that we all can, you know, capitalize on and stand upon because we know what the objective is and the goal that we're trying to achieve. We want to make certain that minorities, you know, obviously are not overlooked or not forgotten, you know, within Nashville, Tennessee. Now, again, being from Dayton, Ohio, you know, different time, you know, only time I go back home is really to see family and I stay under the radar because, you know, there's not a lot of progression taking place there. Nashville is, in fact, you know, the, the place to be. You know, it is the, the it city, you know, if you will. And I've been here, you know, 20 plus years, you know, to date, you know, so working in private industry, left private industry in 2016, you know, last year was first year working 100% under the auspices of my nonprofit organization. Mind you, I established it back in 2010, and that's not the first nonprofit organization that I actually operated. You know, many of you, you know, may recall Music City Jazz Blues and Heritage Festival back 2003 up until 2009 at Riverfront Park. You know, that was directed under my original organization, Nothing But Love. That's the outreach. God is love. We utilize that as the premise, you know, for how we do business, you know, bringing people together in a harmonious, you know, positive environment with the quality exchange. You know, so again, whether it's, you know, multicultural attractions, whether it's you know, turnkey safety services, whether it's, you know, public speaking engagements or, you know, we're mentoring the youth. That's always going to be the underlying premise, you know, behind the work that we do and the reason, you know, why we're here. So just wanted to. Like I said, address the audience and, you know, for awareness purposes, you know, introduce myself and say that I'm here to help. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Do we have anyone else who would be willing to give testimony this evening? Great. Thank you. Hello, my name is Candace Locklear. I'm with ENC Housing. Um, we're a supportive housing here in Nashville, Tennessee, a nonprofit organization. Um, we house mentally ill, um, co-occurring. We also have Grandpa's House, which is a drug and alcohol halfway house. Um, what we do with Metro, I know we started out, Metro would help us with funding to house the guys who got out of jail and didn't have um, room and board and meals. So I've not really on per se had a problem with Metro because they were able to help us. I know we get a lot of emails with different um, things saying that Metro offers this and that. I don't know how to use that. So maybe I could get with someone and figure out more how to use it because a lot of it doesn't have to do with the business that I offer, but different opportunities for our guys, you know, you know, if they were looking for jobs and whatnot. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And we're coming up on the last 10 minutes of testimony this evening. So after her, then yes, sir, you can go next. And you can go after that. I think that might be up to 10 minutes, so you might close this out. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Dr. Huggins Williams. Yes, Huggins Williams is a long last name. My first name is Nedra. And I actually, um, I can't actually say that I've had a problem with Metro because I gave up trying to um, talk to them about opportunities. I own a training business, Global Training Solutions, uh, 15 years, and I've worked for, as this gentleman, IBM as a trainer, Alanda Lakes as a trainer. 
the Research Institute out of North Carolina and started off as a senior trainer for U.S. Department of State, was a foreign service officer for 25 years, nine months, two weeks, eight hours, and 35 minutes. I'm lucky to have been retired at this time, I think. But my, my problem was talking to people about doing business and being told, A, one, I wasn't a Nashvilleian. I'm originally, I, I guess I don't have a home, but I, I call Washington, originally from Washington, D.C., and moved here eight years ago, nine years ago, I'm sorry, nine years ago. And each time I tried to talk to somebody about it, they would ask me if I would know different people. I think your name came up, Mr. Majors. Did I know you? Did I know uh, another gentleman, I think, that owned a bank? I'm trying to be bored. Uh, did I know? And it was as if I had to know other people in the city in order to get an opportunity. I finally did talk with one business who seemed as if private sector business, seemed as if they were very interested. Uh, I was excited. Um, most of my work is still being done overseas, 99.8% of it is overseas. One week out of every month, I'm traveling to either Asia, Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, somewhere, training. This business told me that I actually was not considered as a business because I was a consultant, training consultant. And that consultancy, and I was so glad the gentleman from uh, Kenya spoke, was not really a considered a business. That sort of was very odd, very strange to me. But I listened and um, we discussed the possibility of my doing some training for them only to be told later that a two-person consulting business was not really considered a business. The interesting part about this story was they were bidding on a government contract, which is what I work under all government contracts, all my contracts, I'm a sub under government contracts. It turned out that they did submit my resume under their proposal of an RFP. At that point, I, when I found out about it, I just gave up. I just decided, well, maybe I've been blessed that I don't have to do business in Nashville to earn a living. But I think it would be very helpful for me if I could understand what has been defined as a business. Consulting every place else is considered business. If it's not considered a business in this city, it would be very helpful for me to, to know. I would definitely like to get to talk to you, sir, about some of the things you're doing, and perhaps maybe I could go there. But I think there's one piece of this that was really continues to stand out. And it almost seems, and I may be wrong, and all of you who are here and from Nashville, from Tennessee, you can say, oh, you're wrong. It's not correct. Is that there is a I'm trying to find the right words to say. Um, uh, or rather, it appears to be an incest kind of thing. If you're not from here, then you're not a part. And not being a part makes it difficult if you're a small business, if you're a minority, and if you're a woman. Perhaps for large businesses, obviously, that's not the case. They get big tax breaks and other kinds of breaks. But maybe the fact that one is not a Nashvilleian, or one doesn't have the right connections in Nashvilleian, is a problem. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Cliff Steger. And I'm the uh, president, CEO of uh, C.D. Steger Construction. We're a general contractor. And as a general contractor, all of my work is done as the prime. Uh, I found that my, my best customer is government. Uh, it's uh, difficult getting into the private sector as a prime contractor uh, because they generally want people they've worked with before, uh, who've had some experience in their area, so it's tough getting into that. As a 
uh, prime contractor, uh, and that's uh, construction. Uh, it is, uh, it's easier with the government side because uh, it is done on a competitive basis. Uh, if I've got the best price, uh, they have to have a real good reason not to hire me. And so uh, if I can get the best price, then I get the job. Uh, one of the things that, that I think that would be important for this group to know is that, is that when I go after my subcontractors, and probably 90% of all my work is done by subcontract, I don't have, for all the work that we do, I don't have people in every trade that we may work in. I may be working on a street project where there's all outside excavating, concrete, paving, et cetera, or it may be inside of a building, having electricians and plumbers and carpenters and all of those. Uh, I'd have a big workforce if I had to have all those people on staff. So I subcontract all of that work. When I go after work, I know a lot of the minority contractors, subcontractors in the area. They're on my prime list. I solicit uh, proposals from them on every project that I will bid. If they give me a proposal, I will even take some of them and miss the bid if they knock me out of a bid, uh, but it's a good chance that I could also get it. If their bid is way out of line and I know it's going to knock me out, I'll not even consider them. But my point is, as a minority contractor, I'm looking at the minority community. So when I get a chance to get a job, I'm going to bring a good portion of the minority community with me. Some of the things that might limit me in that capacity is that I've been in business now since 2005. I was working as a construction manager with the state of Tennessee. Before that, I had over 20 years of experience in the military and construction. <clears throat> and so when I started my, my company, uh, the idea was that I would try and get more people in the community involved. So I'm, I'm twice retired from everywhere else. So trying to get the community involved in activity was one of, one of my goals. Someone spoke earlier about the problem with getting uh, those uh, ex-offenders to work. Uh, a lot of my jobs will say, if you've got an ex-offender, you can't bring them on board. That's something that we've got to fix, or we're going to have a lot of people getting out of uh, uh, institutions that can't get a job, and there's no place for them to go. And I would gladly, there are guys out there I know and gals too with great experiences that we could bring on and get them involved in work. And, and, and I would be a tool for bringing them on. Some of my limitations, uh, I've, I've run into this because I'm a small contractor trying to work up. Uh, one of my limitations is bonding, and you grow into that. Bonding folk uh, is another gatekeeper that keeps you from growing and, and controls your growth. Uh, they will uh, see your experience and allow you to grow gradually, but it's also dependent on how much money you got in the bank, too, to, to what level of bonding they'll give to you. Uh, so that's a limitation. So when there are big projects being let on the street, uh, if my bonding is to $2 million uh, and there, there's a package on the street for $5 million, as a prime contractor, I can't bid that project. Uh, if that project could be broken down into small increments so that there is a, a, a million dollar, a million and a half, or two million, that would be within the range. And there are people who with less bonding capacity than I have, they may have $100,000 or $500,000 bonding capacity. If those packages are larger than they can bond, then they're going to be excluded. They cannot even try for the project. That's an area that one can look at. Uh, the other area that I find that, uh, 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 that I've run into, uh, uh, I've gone after work that TDOT supports. Uh, uh, Tennessee, Highway, uh, Tennessee Department of Transportation, monies in any community, they have to live by the TDOT rules. And the TDOT rule says you have to self-perform 30% of the work. Well, with my team of two or three people, we're not going to do 30% of the work. So I cannot compete for that work unless I can perform 30% of it, not as a prime. I can get a piece as a sub, perhaps, but not as a prime. 
that's an area that's limiting. Uh, the state of Tennessee has just put a package out looking for folk to do work for two years. Uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's going to be in smaller packages, but they want to have people on board that can call and say, come and do this work, rather than delaying and having to advertise for every project they put on the street. They just said, whoever gets the work has to self-perform 15% of the work. So there are limitations that are thrown in contracts that even though you're able to go get them, they put a limitation on there that says, oh, there's a stop here, you can't get there. Uh, as we look at contracts, there, there are ways that even though the language is there, there are little catches in the contract someplace that prevents you from going and prevents one from going forward. Uh, the gentleman talked earlier about uh, uh, being stopped because he was, uh, he was a prime and they were not considering him. Uh, 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 I ran into that as well. I had uh, bid a project. Uh, uh, we were the low bidder on it. Uh, Numbers-wise, we were the low bidder, but there was someone else competing against us who said they had minority participation and the points went to them and so even though they bid more, they paid more for the contract, they got the work because they counted their minority group and they would not count me because I was a prime contractor. I complained to, BA, uh, to uh, Metra on that and, and they said, well, we're working on that. I understand that law has been changed now and they do would count my part of that as, as uh, uh, as uh, uh, minority participation. I'm not sure, that's what they tell me. So <laughs> that's another area that, that may be a limiting area. I think that's most of what, uh, what I hadn't planned to come in and say anything, but uh, I thought I'd take advantage of the opportunity. Thank you very much, appreciate it. I just wanted to qu quickly uh mentioned something I didn't mention a few minutes ago, and that was about professional services contracts here in Metro. The Metro Procurement Code allows for them to issue no-bid contracts on professional services uh, through the approval of the mayor. Now, I, one of the things that we did as part of the NAACP was request a listing of the last three physical years uh, professional services contracts that had been issued by the finance department and approved by the mayor. We did that a couple of weeks ago and we got a response back from the finance department indicating that they didn't have such records. Now, I'm here because, saying this because I question the motivation of our city government when they want to hide facts uh, that we know are readily available because you guys got them for your disparity study. But because the NAACP asked for them, they're saying they're not available. Now, uh, we got copies of uh, prime and subcontract from the procurement department for the last five years. Prime and subcontractors, they indicate that African Americans received less than 2% over that five-year time period, which is ridiculous. And I'm thinking, uh, well, we're thinking, that because they're, they're refusing to give the information on professional services, that it's probably even worse. So we, we need some more uh, honesty on the part of our government. Transparency. And transparency, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it appears to us, and maybe we're wrong, that they're hiding information because they know they haven't been doing the right thing. Thank you. Mr. Majors, Mr. Majors, does professional service contract include consultants? Hey, uh, everything tonight has been great. I want to thank you guys. Uh, first, on behalf of Griffin and Strong, on behalf of the Mayor's Office and Metro uh, Business Assistance Office and Procurement, uh, we really appreciate you all coming out this evening to answer questions. Uh, to give you guys perspectives, to give your feedback about your experiences. All these things are definitely valid to us as we go and continue the study process. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will be around for a little while for any questions that you all may have had uh, that you didn't get an opportunity to ask during the hearing. Um, and I will at this time conclude the public hearing. So thank you guys again.